This is Lynn Christian, and I'm welcoming Bryn Collins, who's a licensed psychologist with a practice in Egan, Minnesota. She's the author of a book I found useful, not only as a coach, but as just a human being, called Emotional Unavailability. And that's the book we're going to discuss today. In fact, there is a a model within this book that has absolutely changed the way I work with my clients and my family. So, Bryn, welcome to our call. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's delightful to be with you. Bryn, let's just jump right in. The title of your book is Emotional Unavailability, and we'll probably spend most of our time in this podcast thinking about the model that you share on pages 179 to 180 of the book to sort of set the contents about what we're talking about. And so while you're preparing for that, let me just tell the audience one of my interests is understanding human performance. And one of the places that I consistently see clients and even myself struggling with is to have effectiveness in our exchanges, in our communications with one another. And communication can be broadly defined as any sort of exchange from a glance of the eye to an actual dialogue. So, Bryn, I would like you to just jump in and explain the context of using the model, the the emotional location model, and dive into the depth of this great information that you share. Well, thank you, Lynn. I I greatly appreciate your your compliments. Um, Let's talk first of just a brief framework, emotional unavailability. If that sense that someone is holding you at arm's length and telling you it's your fault. And so if you think about, there are some relationships where that sort of distance is totally appropriate. And that, but in, in relationships with friends, with coworkers, um, with certainly with family members and, and uh, spouses and intimate relationships, you want to have more emotional connection and emotional availability. So in thinking about that, I began to think about where do people stand essentially emotionally in all of their exchanges, and you defined exchanges really clearly. And what struck me was how often we use the word dysfunctional. Right. Um, you know, my, my work is dysfunctional, my family is dysfunctional, my this is dysfunctional. It gets used so often it stops having meaning. And so I'd like to define my view of dysfunction. Dysfunctional behavior interferes with growth, clarity of communication, and equitable concept resolution. Right. So dysfunctional behavior is what doesn't work very specifically in this case in communication. And, Bryn, to the point that you're making, someone who's emotionally unavailable doesn't even have to make it your fault. They can simply just hold you at an arm's length, which is not a comfortable place to be, especially if you're working with coworkers or a peer or a friend or a spouse or a partner or a family member, right? Yes, absolutely. There's that sense of, of a wall. Mm-hmm. being up mm-hmm. that you cannot reach and one tends to observe that wall and think what am I doing wrong it may not be you at all right and in fact what happens is it causes conflict when one or more of the people involved are emotionally unavailable correct yes because that person will take an emotional position that is un- unaffected ineffective and and not solution-focused. And solution-focused is the groundwork for emotional location. My own model that I made up in my head, what it does is to try to define or take a look at where people are in any exchange that you are having with them. And uh, it's based on observation, based on solution-focused therapy, and what we try to do is everybody tries to get into the solver spot. Can I talk a little bit about how the model looks? Based on the handout, there's a center box called solver. And that box can contain anywhere from one to a billion people. Wow. Or seven and a half billion. (laughs) Um, Because solvers work together 
to solve a problem, not find someone to blame or find someone to take advantage of or to control. We're looking at the problem, not at the people Mm. involved, and that's critical. That position becomes a conflict-free position. Yes, because you might feel passionately about a particular stance on a problem, but when you feel passionately about it, if you are in a solver spot, you make a rational case for your feeling. Right. Rather than saying, because it's mine, or because it's my idea, um, that doesn't work with solver language. What works with solver language is, this is the problem, and sometimes you have to spend a while working out what the problem is. Right. Usually, that's where, where a lot of negotiation falls apart, is it's, it has to do with the identification of the problem. Right. And too broad an identification of a problem, particularly in the like, business setting, if there's too broad an identification of a problem, then too much gets in as sounding like a rational solution. So, but you can't act effectively on any of those pieces because the whole is being addressed, not the pieces. Mm. Does that make any sense? Makes a lot of sense. Um, and so what you want to do is break a problem down to its smallest part. Mm. And that, immediately works toward solving the problem. That way there's a lot of things you can just dismiss and say, well, we figured that out. Harry here has figured out that if Joe routes request through him rather than directly to Bill, then all the, uh, the financial stuff gets covered and we don't have to worry about it. That often will break down a problem into quick and easy solutions. In my opinion, that's conflict resolution made quickly. Yes. Whereas if you're trying to identify the big problem mm-hmm. and solve it with one solution, it very rarely works. So in the outlying boxes, blamer, poor me, fixer, and player, those can only be occupied by one person at a time. <laughs> so you can see why the solver spot welcomes everyone. And these... These outlying spots do not welcome everyone. Mm. Let me talk a little bit about the blamer. Yes. The blamer is the person who points the the shaking finger of shame. You are the problem. Um, It's it's a way of deflecting responsibility onto everyone else for things for which they should take responsibility. Blamers are responsibility dodgers. Mm. And they want to make the other person in the exchange feel badly, unworthy, inept, unable, um, or in other words, abused. Mm. Taking power away is abuse. Um, they, they, their objective is control. And they control by fear and intimidation. The dialogue often includes things like never and always and forever as well as blame, and you should, and if only you had, and um, lots of ways of externalizing responsibility for a situation which should be easily controlled. Mm -hmm. There's no solution in blame. There's no looking for a solution. They're looking for someone else to take responsibility. And you know, Bryn, one of the reasons I like this model so much is sometimes you don't know that you're not in the solver position in the middle until you look at these four outlying boxes and realize where you actually are standing. Does, yes. that, does that make sense? Because yes. a blamer may think that they're solving a problem when they're pointing a finger, and they're really not solving a problem. They're actually causing more conflict. Absolutely. And if, if your solution involves somebody else being at fault, it's not a solution. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. If, if a solution has everybody wins, in a solution-focused situation. You also bring out the point in your book that a solver is respectful. That's a respectful position, correct? Absolutely. You want to respect the rights of others. Mm -hmm. You want to respect their power base. You want to have good boundaries. Mm -hmm. That's extremely important. Mm -hmm. Um, You want to use respectful language. And I, I tell couples that I see, for example, that why... It's always followed by the invisible, the heck, 
or worse, um, and a pointing finger. So why is not solution-focused language? It's not, and in fact... Help me understand. Or you must have a good reason. How, how come you made that decision? And, Brynn, I haven't told you this, but as I mentor and teach coaches, I ask them to use open-ended questions and to always avoid why for that very reason. Well, terrific. That is an extremely important thing. You know, one thing you don't want in a negotiation is for anybody to feel in a successful negotiation. Right. It's for anybody to feel disempowered. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, I, I, have had, I have had my experiences with negotiations where everybody's trying to win. Mm-hmm. That's not a real negotiation. That's trying to win. Negotiation is looking for a solution, mm-hmm. not trying to beat somebody else. That's one of the reasons labor unions are having trouble now, because <laughs> the bosses are trying to win and the labor union is trying to win, mm-hmm. and then nobody wins. So is there uh, anything else about the blamer we need to know before you tell us about the next box? Well, blamers are kind of aggressive. Their style makes them feel powerful and in control. Mm-hmm. And apparently the feeling is, if I can point to someone else who's wrong, I'm right. Okay. Um, that's very Western thinking of either or. Um, both and is the way to approach the negotiation. Both of us are responsible for this, and I accept my responsibility. Not, it's all your fault. And the, me- the message a blamer sends is, you as a person are bad. Not mm. this is a bad situation, but you as a person are bad, taking away your power and your personhood and creating guilt and shame. Neither one of those is a good position to be in for negotiation. So when we're blaming, we are actually causing disruption, disagreement, and conflict. Yes. And remember, only one person stands in that blamer box. Um, if you get two blamers in a room, one of them ends up being in the next box, which is the poor me. And the poor me is always the recipient of the blamer's wrath. And the poor me deals with this by saying, you're right, it is my fault. I'm a terrible person. I have no idea why I do these things. But, and but erases everything that came before it, I'm the victim of something. And usually it turns out to be, I'm the victim of you pointing at the blamer. (laughs) So we have a vicious circle. This is the classic abuse relationship because then they switch places. The blamer is the victim as long as there is a poor me is the victim as long as they can tolerate that, and then they turn into the blamer and guess who becomes the poor me? The original blamer. Right. So in marriages, for example, these are classic abuse relationships. But I can see how in a business relationship this would also be an abusive relationship. Always blaming things, and finally the employee turns around and says, it's all your fault, and boom, they switch places. Neither of these is a good power position. No, or even entrepreneurs that are business partners or that sort of thing can fall into this dynamic. Absolutely. You want to take responsibility for who you are and what you do. Be able to say, this was not my intent, or um, I apologize, or I own that I made this mistake, and then some magic words. What do we need to do to solve this problem? One very effective way to break up that cycle of the poor me and the blamer is to say, I'm sorry you feel that way. Not in the snotty version of that, but in the genuine, (laughs) to solve this problem or to resolve this issue. Mm -hmm. Immediately what you're doing is identifying that it is not the person who's the problem. Right. Which is a classic part of this model that I love so much, Bryn. It's not about the people. It's identifying the problem, stating it. If there's some emotions around that, you acknowledge those, and then you go to the the question of how do we move to the middle and solve this, which would you repeat again? What would be some verbiage you would use to move someone from the victim position into a solving position in the center with you? Well, certainly you want to invite them into a solar spot. And you do that by using collaborative language. Can we work together on this problem? Or to help me understand how you see what's wrong here. Help me understand what your vision is of the solution. And so what you're doing is immediately becoming a team. Mm-hmm. And solvers are very teamwork-oriented. So you're 
together inviting them to identify what's the problem. And now that we know what the problem, can we agree that that's it? How do we move to the center, get on the same page, and deal with this problem? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. How do we solve this problem? So on the other side, the fixer and the player. Mm -hmm. Now, do understand that people jump in and out of these boxes. There are some people who live in these boxes, and they go nowhere else. They have no interest in becoming solvers. They need to be in control and blame, and, and they are the toughest to recruit to the solver spot. Interestingly, though, once you recruit them, they are the most enthusiastic, um, and I've seen it time and again. So on the other side, on the top, we have the fixer. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the loving, caring kind of fixing that solvers do. Your friend calls you and says, I am the world's worst co and my husband's out of town, and the kids are running crazy. Um, and you say, you know what, I've got a free evening. Let me come over and kind of get the kids wound down and read to them a little bit and bring you some chicken soup. And that's a solver kind of fixing. Okay. Because the solver also has the option to say, wow, that's really terrible. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So the solver retains choice. And choice always equals power. As long as you have choice, you have power in a situation. So in this case, the solver says, I make the choice to come and help you. The fixer does things for people they don't even ask them to do. The fixer comes in and says, oh, your, your department is organized all wrong. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to change around how the, how the paper supply is allocated, and I'm going to change where everybody works. They are not trying to, to listen to other people's input. They're trying to be in control. Well, in my opinion, and I could be off, when I read this part about the fixer, these people are too nice, too helpful, and probably codependent. Very much so. Passive aggressive is being nice to your face and seeming to want to be helpful, but it's a kind of help by intrusion and mm -hmm. implication. Okay. Passive aggressive people will... will do something allegedly for you and then blame you when it doesn't work out the way they expect. Right. And that's fixers. Fixers are, um, are operating from control and smothering. Mm. They're just going to be so nice to you that you can't breathe. Taking care is doing something for a person they cannot do for themselves. Caretaking, which is that that codependent stuff is doing something for someone they can and should do for themselves. Right. That's a good distinction. Whenever uh, we do something that somebody else could, should, or ought to be doing for themselves, that's codependency. Yes. And codependency is a, going back to the dysfunctional word, dysfunctional position. Okay. The fixed E has no choice or power in the situation. Mm -hmm. And no problem is being solved. Mm. Except there's the lower right-hand corner box, the player. Players are in it for themselves. Players want what they want, and they'll tell you what they want, and you better go with it. That's how it's going to be. They're like dictators? Well, beyond dictators, they don't care about you. Oh. So I suppose in that sense, they are kind of dictators. The player sounds like they're a bit narcissistic and self-centered. Oh, exactly that. Right on the money. They're often drug or alcohol addicted as well. Mm. And that player-fixer relationship is the one of codependency. Yes. It's also the one of, of desertion and, and no reciprocity. The energy goes all from the fixer to the player. Mm. There's mm -hmm. no exchange of energy at all. Okay. Um, the fixer gives the player stability. Player gives the fixer the illusion of having something to fix without ever being able to do it. Oh, yes. Okay, very elusive. Yes. Um, my favorite example is the player goes to the casino and loses the rent money. And the fixer says, um, oh, no, you've lost the rent money. And, well, don't worry about it. I'll just work extra hours next week and I can borrow some money from my mom and we'll just figure it out. Don't worry about it. 
A mm-hmm. solution-focused person says, wow, that's a problem. How are you going to fix that? Players yeah. don't like solvers. Look at a blamer and a player. Mm-hmm. The player just blows off blamers. Right. You know, oh, whatever. But the fixer will often jump into the blamer spot when dealing with a player. And then the player moves over and becomes the victim, the poor me. Okay. Why are you always picking on me? I was trying to earn second what's rent. So we're always in, I should say, a non-optimal position when we're on the outskirts in those four boxes. And in order for us to move to the center, again, Bryn, you call this Dr. Collins, uh, is it the Dr. Collins' magic words? Yeah. I sort of see this uh, solution-oriented verbiage as a form of relationship Aikido, meaning you use the energy the person's showing up with, their emotional location, and you handle that energy in such a way that it does not harm you or them. So set us up again and show us how do we move someone, including ourselves, from being on the outskirts into the center. Well, first of all, you have to be in the center to move someone. The best way to be in the center is to be in the center as much as possible. Okay. And if you catch yourself being in, in a, uh, you know, I don't like me, everybody hates me, I think I'll go eat worms, sort of for me stuff. You have to call it that and back out and become solution focused. Everybody gets in the funk. Yeah, we do. It's okay. Yeah. Everybody gets mad and points the finger at somebody else. That happens. It's how you catch yourself and go back. Wait a minute. Let me own that I just did that. And let me move to the solver spot Mm -hmm. and find the name of the problem and the name of the solution. A lot of people make the mistake of jumping into finding a solution before they've identified the problem. Right. So let's go, let's go over the bullet points that you have in the book about how you identify the solver position. What you want to do as a solver is search out truth and collaboration. Don't get all mixed up in personalities and don't, don't take on somebody else's issues um, as a therapist uh, or a coach. You know that sometimes you get caught up in the drama of the moment, the reason you're there, and people want you to take sides, and, well, we know Harry's wrong, because Harry's always wrong, and, it, you know, you, come, you find yourself in the center of the whirlwind, and so being in the solver spot takes you out of the whirlwind. Right. So you genuinely, to be in that solver spot, you want to have a solution, you want some self-efficacy in being able to see where you're responsible, believe in yourself to be able to see how to be trustworthy, respectful for other people, truly want a solution instead of getting into that triangulation or running around the quad on the outside. Yes. Let's go back to the question of how do you set it up again when, you know, one of the things I have, have learned from you is I'll use statements like, it sounds like you have some strong feelings about that. How can we get on the same page and solve this? Or, I see you have an opinion. My opinion's different. How do we put our opinions either aside or together and see if we can come to some resolution? So those are two ways I've been able to move into a solver position and bring somebody with me when I notice that we, we could benefit from this model. Would you go over, like, the six magic words and the formula for people to sort of keep in their minds of how to resolve conflict and get to a problem solution instead of causing more problems? The magic words that I talk about in the book are, I'm sorry you feel this way. And as I said, not in a snotty tone, but in a genuine, I expressing empathy, not sympathy. Sympathy is a one-down, power, powerless taking power position, but empathy, which is understanding and compassion. Um, I'm sorry you feel this way. And then you invite them to join you. Mm. What can we do together to solve this problem? Right. Help me identify this problem. Help me understand your opinion. Help me see your position on this. I'm not clear about what your position is. Can you help me understand it? Those words are in our invitations. Mm. Whereas, I, my idea is, suddenly you're not in the solver position. Right. 
unless you have heard the other person's position as well. And so um, what you want to do is, is in, in your head, ask yourself, where am I standing? Mm. Am I standing in the solver spot on, in this conflict, or am I in one of the outlying spots? Mm-hmm. And if I'm one in, in one of the outlying spots, what am I hoping to accomplish? And as soon as you ask yourself, what am I hoping to accomplish, it really makes it crystal clear, or it should make it crystal clear to you, that you're not in a position where, that, where you're looking for a solution. You're in a position where you're looking for someone to validate your position. Right. You may not come out with everything that you want. Good negotiation is everybody goes away with wanting a little more of something that's satisfied with what they got. Mm-hmm. And without focusing on a negotiating strategy where everybody wins, you're not in the solver spot. So you want to check yourself. You want to invite other people into the solver spot. You want to use collaborative language. We, us, our, um, this, you know, this is our problem to solve. Who's got ideas? Mm. Let's brainstorm. And so it becomes respectful for everybody sitting in that circle. And you might have somebody who is absolutely stuck in one of the outlier positions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're trying to accomplish something, and that other person is stubbornly stuck at the blamer. Right. Well, if Harry wasn't such a bad person, we'd all have this figured out. Poor Harry, I'm picking on you today. But and when they are doing that, you say, other than blaming Harry, well, how do you see this problem? So what you're doing is gently saying, hey, you're being a blamer, and then saying, come and join us. Come in the circle. Let's solve this problem together. And there are people who stubbornly stick to not wanting to be collaborative. Sure. You have to keep inviting them. At some point, they will back themselves out of the conversation. So the solver actually is very patient and continues to give invitations to meet in the center. Yes. It also keeps arguments way down because people don't feel they have to score on other people. Mm, and right. The solver, if everybody's in the solver spot, nobody wants to. Right. If you've got somebody who's like a blamer or a fixer or worse yet a player who has an agenda, you have to figure out as you roll how to pull that person into some solution that they can agree to. Because there are some people who are hopeless players or hopeless blamers Mm -hmm. who never will move from that spot. Right. And so there are times that the strategy ends up being okay, the five of us are going to figure this out and Harry's going to just be out in the field. Bryn, does this model work with somebody that you might call a stonewaller? Oh, yes. Again, accepting the fact that some people are so locked into where they are that you cannot move them, and they are indeed behind a stone wall. But in general, a stonewaller, is what, what that person is doing is saying, I don't feel safe mm. with with the, the solutions that we've come up with, I don't feel safe with the ideas that we have. And I don't have any ideas of my own, so I'm just going to be stubborn and sit here. Could you help us see how to turn a stonewaller into a, into the solver position? Well, I think with everybody, one thing you want to do is to identify where someone is and then ask, ask yourself, why are they there? Because people won't do something that's uncomfortable for them. For example, if you have a solver and everybody in the group is a solver, people are not looking to get over on somebody else. Mm -hmm. They're looking to to find a workable solution. If, however, you have a player who would tend to be a stonewaller because they're not going to budge unless they get everything they want, what you want to do is to to look beyond the behavior Mm -hmm. and ask yourself, what are they getting from this? Mm. And you have to kind of do this stuff all on the fly, which makes it hard. Right. But you, you want to look at the behavior and say, okay, well, let's see. Jim, Jim doesn't want to do this. And why is that? Well, maybe Jim's afraid he'll lose his job if we reorganize the department. So the next step then is to 
is to identify, for example, we'll stay with Jim, and to say, Jim, your help in this reorganization is critical because we need you as part of this balance. And bring him in by quietly and respectfully identifying what you think the problem. And then finding a very respectful way, again, respect is the key, Mm -hmm. finding a very respectful way to invite him to join the process. Right. And so somebody who's stonewalling has an agenda or a fear. Would that also be the case with people who are chronically defensive? Yes. Okay. Because defensive and stonewalling are kind of the same behavior. Mm-hmm. And look beyond it. Usually what's driving stonewalling or defensiveness is fear. Okay. It might be, I don't want to look bad. I don't want to sound like I'm an idiot. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to think that I'm going to get blamed for this by uh, Jim. Jim and Harry are in bad trouble today. Um, <laughs> But what you want to do is to keep reminding everybody that you are looking for a solution to a problem that you will all identify together. Mm -hmm. Bryn, you're teaching me something, which is if we want to avoid conflict, because, you know, you don't have to solve conflict, you don't have to resolve it if it doesn't exist, we should probably be serving ourselves and those we're with to become better communicators and learning how to be solution-oriented right from the get-go. Yes. Well, it serves you well. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want a refund from from Bill's sporting goods stores and you walk in and slam the item down on the counter and say, you sold me this bad item, how cooperative is Bill going to be? But if you go in and say, you know, I may have made a mistake here. I thought I was buying such and such. Mm-hmm. And instead... I ended up with this tennis racket, which I don't think is what I need for baseball. And you can both laugh about it, and Bill is definitely joining you in the solver spot at that point. Right. You're not beating yourself up. You're identifying that, you know, a tennis racket is not going to be the solution for playing baseball. Right. And nobody gets hurt. Everybody gets what they want. I love it. This has made a big difference in my life, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to share your tool what have we not talked about that you believe would be critical for our listeners to understand about your model and about your work in getting to the solution-oriented stance? Practice, practice, practice. If you have a four-year-old, you're going to have trouble getting them to join you in the solver spot. But that's exactly when you want to teach kids negotiating techniques. Mm-hmm. They're at four is a little early, but when they get to five or six, they get, if if you hang out and are good with me in the store, then at the end, you have a 25-cent budget or a 50-cent budget or whatever to choose something you want. Mm. You're setting boundaries, you're establishing limits, and you're giving them power. Mm-hmm. And then you also have the negotiating technique of saying, you know... We agreed in the car before we came in that you were not going to ask me for everything we went past. And I think you didn't hold up your end of the bargain today. Or I want to affirm, I want to, Jimmy, I want to tell you, you did a great job today. I'm really proud of you. And here's the dollar to spend on whatever you want. And you can save it if you want to. Giving little guys the opportunity to make choices like that builds a kid who is better at negotiating and less likely to get into fights and less likely to join a gang Mm -hmm. and very much more likely to work their way through the awful maze that is school, Mm -hmm. especially middle school, and, and be successful in life. Right. But if you didn't learn negotiation skills when you were little... You can learn negotiation skills as an adult. Mindfulness is really probably the key. I agree. Where am I at the moment? Mm-hmm. Where is everyone else at the moment? And this model gives us a chance to actually apply that mindfulness and sort of locate where we are and where the other person is and then try to find a pathway to the solution orientation. This is a complex model. Even though on its, on its surface it looks kind of simple, mm-hmm. um, the more you think about it, the more complicated it becomes 
because if you're in a group of five or six people and you've got one person who's a blamer and one is a poor me and a couple of fixers and one player, you have to figure out how to invite everybody in at the same time without spending the whole day at the meeting. Right, that's, that's, that is it. And what I learned about this, I took this book with me on vacation had a situation where I could use it, used it in a very simple, rudimentary fashion. And since that time, I've been able to get deeper into the complexities by reviewing your notes and practicing, practicing like you've said. So anybody who wants to try this, I would recommend you get Bryn's book. You specifically read pages 179 to 180. Bryn has tremendous information in there in helping you identify where we play and live in relationship to other people and the pages that come before this section. But Bryn, if somebody were to get in touch with you beyond purchasing the book, how would they be able to have a dialogue with you? Where's your blog? What are the other resources you offer? Well, I have a website, uh, BrynCollins.com. Um, I also have a Facebook page, Emotional Unavailability. And um, they can email me at Bryn at BrynCollins.com. You are good at responding. I can attest. As soon as I, uh, I think it was even during the holidays, I reached out and asked a question, and you were on it the next day. <laughs> well, I try. I don't, that's not always the case, but I try as best I can to, yeah. to respond quickly. And I don't do, I, let me say I don't do therapy in intensity, in intense ways, um, in responding to, to questions. If we're going to get into a therapeutic relationship, I actually do see clients from all over the world via Skype. Nice. Okay. And um, in some cases, it's through insurance. In some cases, they choose to pay themselves. But um, I think it's, you know, it's a door that's open and more and more frequently. Um, the, my industry is recognizing that our client base does not have to be next door. Right. So people, uh, how would people contact you in order to schedule a Skype session? Um, uh, the best way is probably through my email at Bryn at BrynCollins.com, mm-hmm. one N, and, um, or to call me uh, at 952-953-3332. You'll probably end up having to leave me a voicemail, but I will get back to you. 24 to 48 hours. Um, if you identify it as an emergency situation, I'll do the best I can to get that to you right away. I'm working on a new book called mm. The Emotionally Unavailable Parent, given the fact that I wrote this book in the, in the middle 90s. Right. It was published in 97, and it's still going strong. Well, I found it and found it very useful in my practice and in my personal life. It explains quite a few of the dynamics that all of us experience. And I'm surprised there's not more written on this topic, but your book, even though it was published in the 90s, is quite relevant and right on the nose with solutions. So I want to give you props for that, and I can't wait to see what the new book is. Yes. Any last bit of wisdom, if you were to give your best advice to our listener, what would it be? (laughs) It would be from my grandmother who said, you attract more flies with honey than with vinegar. If you're trying to deal with somebody, yelling is not an effective tool. Whining is not an effective tool. What is an effective tool is inviting someone in to be a participant with you in solving the problem. Well said. 